Hi, I'm Curious Cass, and this is Curiosity Junkie. Today, we begin part one of a two-part series featuring a special guest here to share her experience with life-threatening allergies, surviving anaphylactic shock, and how that changed her relationship with food and those around her. She also has some tips on how those of us not living with life-threatening allergies can help alleviate some of the daily burden and stress. Please welcome Kelly Burton to the podcast. Hi, Kelly Burton. Welcome to the Curiosity Junkie podcast. Hey, Cass. This is my daughter, my amazing daughter, Kelly Burton. So we're just going to jump in, Kelly, and start talking about growing up with some pretty extreme allergies and living restrictions, basically. Oh, yeah. So a little bit about what conditions I have and what I'm living with for folks. So I have asthma which is essentially where your lungs get really tight and it's difficult to breathe. Um, I have eczema and that was more in my childhood that I've grown out of now as an adult, but we'll talk about how that still comes back to bite me in the butt a little bit. Yeah. Um, And that is where you have patches of raw red skin and they're very itchy. And then I have severe allergies. So I have severe food allergies and then severe allergies that are environmental. Um, Severe food allergies means that when I ingest my allergens like peanuts, cashews, or pistachios, that um, 10 to 15 minutes later, my throat is closing up. I cannot breathe. Um, I'm having severe cramps in my stomach and I need to go to the hospital and get it sorted or inject myself with an EpiPen so that I can go to the hospital and get myself taken care of. Um, Environmental allergens are like ragweed. You might have heard that called hay fever Mm -hmm. or dust mites, which are just tiny little mites that live all over the world. Um, (laughs) Yes, they're very difficult to get away from. Yeah. Except I found moving to Colorado that they do not thrive at a high elevation. So Ah. we'll talk about that impact on me as well. But that's a little bit about my allergens. Some people have it worse than I do, um, where they can't be in a room with an allergen. I just can't ingest it. Um, Some people have it not as bad. Right, right. And I think a lot of people have some form of an allergy seasonal, Mm -hmm. something that they have to deal with regularly or semi-regularly or that kind of thing. And the allergies we're really going to kind of dive into today are more severe allergies that even what I think about is a lot of the things you deal with when you have a seasonal allergy on top of all of that, it can be extremely intense and scary where for other people, it's just, oh, I can't breathe for a few days. My eyes are watery. My throat's itchy, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I always think about like, wow, this, your stuff started really young. Like we're talking, I remember when you came home from the hospital, it was a few months after and you had like these red in, in all of the creases, like behind your knees, in your crease of your elbow couple of other spots, some on your hands a little bit, but it really started out kind of small. And we were like, what is this? We took you just to a regular doctor. And at first we were told, oh, it's like impentigo, or she's got some kind of ringworm. So for months we're dealing with that, putting some kind of steroid or whatever, your baby, you know, you, yes. it didn't really make you irritable. It just, bothered us because we're like this can't be normal like why is this raw and red and then we went back to the doctor and they were like oh it's not going away it's got to be staph infection so then we treated you for staph and (laughs) and then at some point and I have no idea how old you were we go I don't know I think somebody said to us maybe you should take her to like a dermatologist and we're like oh you think okay So we take you to a dermatologist and they're like, oh, she's got eczema. And I remember thinking, I'm such an idiot parent in the moment, you know, like, why didn't we think of doing this before? 
and she was like, honey, it's, it's pretty common. It's not, you know, like there's not a lot you can do for it. There are things you can put on it, but it's just something that you're going to have to live with all your life. And you go, as a parent, you just go, oh my God, I feel so bad. But it's, you know, you have to deal with it. So then it's like, okay, so how do we, how do we deal with it and manage it as, as you're growing up? And that was the first, like the, your, it's called um, eczema. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing we really started to have to deal with. That is so interesting to hear your side of the story from this, because mm -hmm. my earliest memories only come in around, you know, five or six years old about my asthma and my eczema and my allergies. So I love hearing the side of the parent. Yeah. I just remember the tar baths. You would have to sit yes. in that tub and soak, and it was just like brown water and <laughs> gunk like tar. Like it smelled medicinal. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, you would just get in there and be like, you okay. <laughs> I remember, but I think I did that, those tar baths. It's like this yellowy brown liquid tar that you would put in the tub um, and you would sit in it for like 30 or 40 minutes. You had yeah. to sit in it for a very long time. And it was a good thing that I really loved bath <laughs> and, and I love toys, you know, <laughs> and I think I would do that probably around 10 years old is when I think. I stopped doing that and when maybe some hormones kicked in and my eczema started to change. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's, I was talking to somebody just the other day about that because we were talking about your eczema and that I was going to have an opportunity to talk with you and share your story. And they were like, does she still have it? And I said, yes, but there was something about in like when her hormones started to yes. develop and kick in, that's when it subsided. It wasn't as bad. I think you still had little bouts with it, but it wasn't. Exactly. That memory is spot on. I remember, yeah, it was about 10, 11, 12. I think hormones are starting to kick in more. And that's something you see across um, allergens as well is hormonal changes can change and affect your allergens too and what you're allergic to or what you're not allergic to anymore. Um, but with the eczema, yeah, it just kind of went away. So I still have um, scars on my hands, my feet, the back of my knees, the insides of my elbows, the places you were talking about. Um, and that's because they would fester. And essentially, I could not stop from scratching them. And I remember as a kid having to wear oven mitts to bed because I, you just couldn't stop. It's like if you don't have psoriasis or eczema, the best way I can explain it is it's like when you get poison ivy oh. and it's just so itchy and all you want to do is scratch it and yeah. that only makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yeah. I oh, remember was... you having, like you would be sitting watching cartoons and we would have to put little socks on your hands yes. because we would walk in and you would just be sitting there you had it on your knuckles and you would just be rubbing yeah. them on the carpet. And I was thinking, oh my God, this is so itchy. how maddening that itch is. Like I kind of think about a mosquito bite. Like when mm. you get a mosquito bite and you, it itches and you're trying really hard not to scratch it, but you know, you're going to, <laughs> yeah. Uh. It is like that. But you know, when I look back on it, and I think that's sort of the perspective of a child. I don't know. I, I never felt for my eczema specifically that it made me feel any different or that it was like this big struggle. Like I love taking baths, so I didn't mind taking a 45 minute bath every night. Um, you know, oven mitts, that was a frustration. And I remember like, I mean, when you go to bed, you can't really control what you're doing. And I would remember waking up and there would be, you know, blood spots and stuff in the bed because I had just scratched my skin raw throughout the night. So those were sort of the only things that really like afflicted me from my eczema yeah. as a child. Yeah. And then very short, funny story. Um, speaking of the ringworm, so I'm a teacher now and I work with six and seven year olds. And 
a few weeks ago, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I've moved to Colorado. It's so dry here. My eczema is coming back, I think. You know, I was starting to get these small patches of dry skin, very similar to eczema. I wait a few weeks, you know, I start putting lotion on more and like, you know, doing ointment and stuff. <laughs> and weeks go by and I'm like, oh my God, it's all over me. This is not how eczema works. And it's ringworm. <laughs> oh my <God. laughs> so, Small story about how something that has not affected my life for a long time came back and kind of reminded me, oh yeah, if you were anybody else who didn't have eczema or psoriasis or something like that, you would immediately see a rash and go to the doctor. <laughs> right, right. But you're like, oh, it's just my stuff. I deal with it. It's no big deal, right? <laughs> yes. Well, let's move into the asthma because that was the next thing that happened. And that for me was probably the most intense, most worrisome until the next thing comes up. But this was the scariest. So you were two and I can't even remember how it happened, but you're, you're bre you went into like barely being able to breathe and you were like struggling to take a breath in. So it was that, and you're two. And your dad and I are completely freaked out. We rush you to the hospital and they diagnose you with respiratory, it's RSV. I'm not really sure what it stands for, but it's some kind of virus in the respiratory system, which means you now have asthma because you've damaged the airways. Well, not you, but your body has been compromised. Your lungs have been compromised. And so now you have asthma on top of your eczema at the age of two. And I just remember year after year having to take you to the hospital. You had a nebulizer at home. We had all the stuff, you had inhalers, but there were still times when most of the time we lived in a farm community and that would start, they would replow the fields. And it took us a while to really connect what that was, like many years. Mm -hmm. And every year around that time of year, you would end up in the hospital because no matter what we did, it just wasn't enough for your breathing. And that is the scariest thing as a parent. I can't, I can't wait to hear your, how you feel about not being able to take a breath, but that is the scariest thing to see your child, you know, they are struggling to take a breath and all of a sudden you can't breathe. And you just go and I go into panic mode, like, oh, where's the nebulizer? Get the <laughs> Oh my goodness. It's terrifying. So yes. share what it's like from your side. I think uh, there are, it's hard. There are a couple of things that come to my mind. Um, I'll start first with maybe what that was like as a kid mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, again, as a child, you're just a bit naive. Like you're just living your life. And right you're just going. Um, so I remember I do have memories. Mine probably start at about, again, four or five years old where I'm doing the nebulizer, which is this like at home machine that breathes, um, medicinal air into your lungs for you. So I remember doing that. Um, I remember having my inhaler that came with me, my albuterol inhaler that came with me to school. Um, I was very active as a kid, so I was doing basketball and like just running around and just being a kid. I really enjoyed sports. Um, and I remember not wanting to stop doing sports, but having to take constant breaks. And I was lucky that my father was there to be one of my coaches for a lot of the sports and things that I did. So he would make it very normal to like take a break and just step out when you needed to. So I don't know. I think as a kid, I don't really remember being scared because I couldn't breathe. I think because I had a lot of trust in my parents that you all would help me because you always had, you know, in that childhood. Um, I remember having a sleepover with a childhood friend and um, I had done the nebul nebulizer already. You know, I had it had already been kind of a bad night <laughs> in terms of my asthma acting up. I had done the nebulizer. I had like taken the puffs of my inhaler, you know, and then I just remember so badly 
wanting to do the sleepover with my friend and so badly just wanting to like be a kid and not have to worry about this. And that was the first time I remember like embarrassment or like um, feeling a sense of like hate to my asthma Mm -hmm. and feeling like, oh my God, I just don't want this because my friend had to go home. I had to go to the hospital and it just reminded me, oh, you're not like everybody else. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. You know, Um, And that's the one thing we want, especially as you're a kid, you want to fit in. You want to just be like everybody else. You want to be accepted. I mean, even adults want that, but yeah. Ah. Totally. And with the asthma nowadays, as I've grown up and become more of an adult and I'm very independent, um, it's interesting. I think it still affects me. Um, So I had to take a inhaled steroid twice a day for years. So while I was living in Missouri, while I was living in Seattle, I had to take this inhaled steroid twice a day, every day, or else I would be wheezing when I tried to go to bed at night or wheezing when I tried to, you know, go to the gym or do any sort of activity. Um, And one, that's expensive and that stinks. (laughs) Yes, very. And then... Secondly, you know, now I don't have to take my asthma medication anymore. I don't take it at all because um, I've realized that as an adult now, my asthma is only sports induced or allergen induced. So eliminating dust mites means that I eliminated my asthma essentially. Wow. Um, Yeah, which is fantastic news um, because for those of you who don't know, some of those inhaled steroids, if you are wanting to get pregnant and have a child, they will cause severe birth defects, no matter what way you cut it, Um, almost 100% guaranteed. So you either have to find a different medication, um, which is a pain to not know if you're going to be able to breathe on your new medication. Right. You're like, is this going to (laughs) work? (laughs) <laughs> or if you're lucky like me and it's just dust mites, you can find somewhere where those things don't exist um, and you can breathe easier. <laughs> so there's a bit of that. Um, I do find frustration. I'm still a very active person. I love to go hiking, camping, um, living in Colorado. I would love to do, you know, the mountains and more mountaineering, but I have to acknowledge that it's just something I can't do. Oh, right. It's not available for me because cold weather activates my lungs and triggers them to close up. So when I'm, you know, at 10,000 elevation and I'm trying to go higher and trying to hit the peaks of mountains and you're losing oxygen already because you're gaining an elevation, it's just not a possibility for me or it would take me hours and hours and hours and I would never want to do it alone because yeah. you know god forbid something happen and I'm alone um and there's nobody to help me so that's how it affects me more now is I know that when I go on a run or I'm with other people who are active I take twice as long to do any sort of hike than anybody else does mm-hmm. you know and you sort of have to come up with your coping mechanisms for that and I've learned to accept my body and that's what it is. It's not going to change. That's okay. Yeah. And I just enjoy taking a longer time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Gotta look for the beauty around you a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. And one of the reasons we're sharing this conversation is that you have to come to accept that that is the body you have. You do have limitations, but what can you do? To, to still be active, to still live the life that you really want to live, knowing that you have some limitations with your physical body. Yes. So, and that's okay. I've come better to terms and agreement with for my asthma. But when we start to talk about allergies, as you said, that's the most severe. Um, yeah. And it's the most severe emotionally as well. Yes. Yeah, I would think so. Um, okay, so let's let's get into that. So, birth basically, you you had eczema, or somewhere in those first few months, it popped up. So we, we're dealing with that, and that's a constant. And then about two, 
and I think it was actually right around your birthday, you ended up in the hospital with the RSV, which created damage to the lungs, and now you have asthma. So that's a constant, and it was pretty severe asthma. We lived in the Midwest, so there were a lot of allergens and um, that kind of thing when we found out that you had DEFCON, I love saying DEFCON 4 peanut allergy. <laughs> It is a level four, so that's correct. <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Um, because I just remember as a parent offering, Jake loved peanut butter. He's firstborn. So apples and peanut butter were a big thing. And you would never touch it. We'd put it on that plate with the apple and you would just be like, no. And you would eat the apples. You loved apples. Never thought anything of it. You are, this is how I remember this happening. You are in, um, kindergarten or preschool and they were having an event at the elementary school and they were doing this really cool project where you take a pine cone you roll it in peanut butter and then you roll it in bird seed and it's a bird feeder so you're in there and you're rolling and i just remember looking down at you <laughs> you look up at me and your eyes like boom swollen shut it's huge and i'm like what the heck is going on? I'm like, yank you up. And I'm like, we gotta go. We gotta get some Benadryl. I, I honestly thought it was the bird seed or the pine cone had something on it that you had rubbed on your eye. So we take you home, we put some Benadryl in you and we chalk it up to the pine cone or whatever. I don't think we really took any action on it at that time. But I remember that being severe and like terrifying and then i can't remember what was the next thing that made us go huh we should probably have her tested i think i remember that story because i've heard it before from hmm. you my dad and my brother um but i don't think i actually remember it in my body as myself peanuts have a very distinct smell anyway they do um, definitely a very strong smell. And for me, when I smell that, I guess it would be like somebody maybe smelling like a skunk. Like it's very identifiable or like a perfume you really don't like. And it kind of just makes you like make your little disgusted face. And you're like, Ugh. like I know that that's inherently not good for me. Yes. Or maybe I've learned that that's not good for me because it makes my eyes swell or it makes my lips swell or you know whatever it is. And you associate those two things. So I've got a very keen sense of smell for peanuts and peanut butter now. They're in the room with me, I know. <clears throat> but I remember avoiding that allergen. And then I think the first time I got tested, I had to be 10, 12, somewhere around fifth or sixth grade, somewhere like that. Yes. Um, and I remember being terrified to do the testing because it was going to be needles going into my back. <laughs> right, right. I remember pinching myself around the house, trying to like build up my tolerance for pain. And I went to the doctor's office and it was so easy. I it know. It felt like somebody scratching my back. Like it was almost pleasurable. And <laughs> yes, yes. I remember they had these um, rectangular containers that had... Mm, I don't know, nine to 12 different allergens and needles. And then they would place them on your back and sort of rub them in. And then you would lift them up and you would say, oh, um, that one swelled up to the size of a quarter. She's really allergic to that one. Or right. that one didn't swell up at all. Okay, that's not an allergen. You can cross that off the list. So I remember that happening, but I don't remember me ever getting a conversation with the doctor to help understand what that all meant. So mm -hmm. I think it was more to like you and my dad, um, because you're the parents and I'm 10 years old at that time. So, but what I remember from that was just a confirmation of a peanut allergy. And I don't know if you have any memory from that, but I would love to hear what yours was. I, all I remember the same thing, like it, I was in my head thinking it was gonna be an intense experience and it turns out it was these white plastic little prong things and they just had you lay down and they set them on there and they didn't really even move them a whole bunch. It was just like pressure and they lifted it up and they waited just a, a couple of minutes and they would take a look at it and the ones that swelled up first were the ones they were like, okay, she has an extreme allergy. And then I just remember them, really saying like 
uh, to me, all I heard was it was a peanut allergy that could cause you to go into anaphylactic shock. And I think even just hearing that created some anxiety as a parent. It's just, it was like a weird moment knowing that all of these years before, had you at all come in contact with peanut butter, you could have died if we hadn't been able to get you to a hospital or somewhere quickly. But I don't remember much of the conversation with the doctor other than that. And I think you had a few other allergies. And I remember really wanting to do the test because of your eczema and your asthma. That was prompting a lot of that because we were thinking, what is triggering some of some of this. So let's find out if you had some allergies. So finding out that peanut allergy was DEFCON 4 was like, holy smokes. And then it also seemed normal in a quick amount of time. Like it was no big deal. We have an EpiPen. So there was some mm -hmm. false security, I think, for your dad and I around that. Oh, she's got an EpiPen. We can deal with it. No big deal. <laughs> yes. And I think that probably came to me as well, right? I um, my allergen wasn't so bad that I needed to be at different tables from other kids at school who were eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It wasn't that bad. Um, I just couldn't eat it myself. And for all I knew, that was the only thing I was allergic to. Um, so I wasn't, um, on alert. I didn't really know the science behind allergens and how they worked. And I just knew, oh, okay, if I avoid peanuts and peanut butter, um, and things produced in facilities, you know, with peanuts, I'm good. <laughs> right. Everything's good. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. Um, I do remember as I started to become a teenager and you start going on dates and things like that, I remember a new stressor coming in because I quickly realized, <laughs> I quickly realized that if the person I was dating had eaten, peanuts or peanut butter, or one of my allergens in the past four, five, six hours that that put me at risk as well. So it was this whole, like talk about trust issues, this whole other <laughs> level of, I'm not just trusting you to not hurt me emotionally. I'm trusting you to not send me to the hospital with this. Kill me. Now. Like, can I'm, you just not kill me? <laughs> exactly. I remember in college I was dating this boy and, um, I wasn't aware that restaurants had started cooking with peanut oil, you know, Chick-fil-A, Five Guys. Um, I'm sure there are others. And he had had Chick-fil-A and I went over and, you know, we like kissed hello. And I remember being like, hmm, you know, like usually you get that shock of electricity when you kiss, but this is different. <laughs> <laughs> this one's different. This is tingly. And I think my tongue is swelling up and I think I'm starting to get little bumps of like allergic blisters on my lips. I got to go home. <laughs> oh my God. And I remember I didn't live that far away, just a few blocks. I sprinted home. I drank a whole bunch of Benadryl, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. Um, if it's not bad enough to need an EpiPen, you just right. drink a lot of liquid Benadryl or pop some liquid um, gel pills. And it all went away and it was fine. But it was that moment of, oh my gosh, now anybody that I date, I can't just date casually. I have to ask them to change their lifestyle as well. Yeah. Um, which I think really starts to affect you emotionally, right? Absolutely. Because you're thinking, oh gosh, you know, am, am I worth that? Am I worth somebody giving up these foods? And you don't think of food as this big thing, but it is, you know, food is community. Oh my God. Um, yes. When I go to work and somebody's brought in treats, I either have to, I have two options. I can either elect out of having any of the treats and just not confront my allergens at all, or I can go up to them and say, okay, so, you know, what ingredients did you have? Or can you please provide a list of ingredients next time? And also, did you use any wooden spoons while you were making this? Because wooden spoons can collect my allergens and it can transfer it. You know? <laughs> um, 
Oh my gosh. You know, you've got, and I live with people now and I have housemates. Right. Right. And I have roommates and I have a husband and it's the same thing. You know, you have to, we have two sets of silverware in the house and we have different mixing bowls because I have, for a long time, I felt very guilty feeling like I would stop roommates or housemates or stop my husband from enjoying the foods that they like. Mm. So I've had to be very crafty and you're almost selling yourself. You're like, put your ad out that you're looking for a roommate. Um, you know, I'm awesome. I'm fine. I have severe allergies, but don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I deal with that. You won't have to worry about it. Right, which is crazy. The dating thing. I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about that, and I wanna also talk about as a parent. Once we knew you had a peanut allergy, you have to think about really having conversations with you. I just remember being terrified that you were gonna go to someone's house, drink out of their glass. Even as a teen, you're somewhere, you drink out of their pop can, they've had peanuts or something with peanuts in it. You don't realize it. So we had, I remember talking a lot about that kind of thing. Like you just can't do that. You can't, you have to have your own. You have to make sure nobody else drinks out of it. Like those kind of things. And I remember that just being terrifying when you would go to someone's house, you just have to trust that you are really aware and you I just remember that being a fear-based thing for me that it had to be a little bit intimidating and scary to you when you are going somewhere. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I don't remember it being a big deal when I was a kid or a teenager as much, um, except a little bit about dating. But I think the tipping point for me when my allergy really like just tipped my life upside down and made it a fear for me and made it something that I was thinking about every second of every single day. And I still struggle with that now is when I actually had a really bad allergic reaction and I had to go to the hospital. Uh, me and my brother went to the same college town. He had this trail mix that was like, no peanuts, you know, made a peanut free facility. And he's like, Kelly, you can have some. You know, we were like, yes. And so I had some and I was like, mmm, delicious. And I had a little bit more and I was like, oh, yeah. Um, let's go over to our family friend's house and let's go have some pizza. So we get in the car. And as a person with allergies, anybody else who has allergies, you'll know what I'm talking about here, where there are just things that you start to feel aren't quite right. You're like, hmm, is my tongue itchy right now? I can't really tell. Am I hallucinating this because I just tried something new and I'm freaking myself out and it's a mental game? Or is my tongue actually itchy? And you're like, huh, my lips. You're like, is that swollen? Or again, am I, am I making this happen with my mind because I'm scared? You know, is this really a reaction or am I blowing something up in my head? Um, so I'm in the car and those little things start to happen. And then you know 100% for sure it's a reaction when you've got the bumps and you start to feel like tingles in your throat, which means it's closing up. Right. And I remember being like, we have to go to the hospital. And my dad uh, was in the back and my brother's driving and they're like, what? And I'm like, we have to go to the hospital. I don't know if that had peanuts or what, but we've got to go. You know, I am not okay. I am having a severe reaction. And like, you're sitting in the car and you're trying to be calm because you don't know how far away the hospital is. You don't <laughs> no, I, no, I hadn't really thought about it at that point in my life. It wasn't practice for me to say, okay, how close can I live to a hospital? So <laughs> I'm right. in the car, sitting there, my head kind of back and just trying to like meditatively breathe and not freak out. Um, I remember um, I had my EpiPen but it's one of those things where, um, you know, I can't tell anybody how to use their EpiPen, but for me, I didn't want to use it unless I was like severely in danger, no chance of getting to a hospital in time um, because it's a giant shot of adrenaline and that can have side effects as well. So 
we get to the hospital. I remember I am sprinting through the hospital, running around looking for where the intake is because they're not always super clear, like <laughs> where to drop off. Um, so I'm sprinting around and looking for where the intake is. My dad is sprinting next to me. My brother's parking the car. Um, you know, at that point in time, you're just like in survival mode and you're not really thinking about much except like, where's the intake? Where's the intake? Where's the intake? Help. I need help. <laughs> and we get there and I remember too, I don't know what it's like to work at a hospital. I'm sure it is so difficult, <laughs> but I remember getting there and my dad is like, she's having a severe allergic reaction. She needs immediate help right now. She ate one of her allergens. Like she is going to die. She needs help. And the person at the desk is just like, wow. <laughs> uh, okay. You know? And they were like, well, sit down. And he's like, no, you don't understand. Like she should be on a stretcher. Um, and this doctor comes forward and they get me on a stretcher and they put me back in this room and then from there on out, I just remember um, blacking in and out. Join Kelly and I next week for the complete story on how she survived anaphylactic shock and how that experience changed her relationship with food and the people around her. Thanks again for tuning in, listening, watching. Stay safe, stay curious, and I'll see you next week.